This is the uh, July 26th meeting of the DGR committee. And uh, we are in hybrid mode, I understand. And we've got a quorum of the committee. So I'll introduce the committee first. And then the other counselors, uh, the other counselors that are in chambers. And, and then um, Jeff will help me with, with who is ever on Zoom, because I'm not going to be very good at that. So uh, Howard Graney is with me. Uh, Peter Tallman is with me. Michael Sullivan. Uh, they're on the committee. Then also well, this is uh, behind me. Uh, now we're, we're facing the opposite way. Are, uh, are the acting mayor, uh, Terrence Murphy and uh, Joe McGivern. And Jeff, do we have anybody else? Okay. All right. Sounds good. And we could go right to agenda item one, I think. Move to take item one off the table. A second. Motion made a sec seconded to remove the uh, prior meeting minutes from the table. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, so I don't have any, any question marks about the minutes. I'm very grateful that, in fact, we, we have minutes from the prior two meetings. I'm very grateful that we, uh, that, you know, so it's a really good summary. Uh, I, I had no issues at all with them. So uh, does anybody have any, an amendment or a, or a comment that they want to make relative to the minutes? No, I agree. They're well written, very well written. Okay. No, make a motion to accept the, uh, Previous minute, motion meeting minutes. Motion made a second to um, to accept the uh, prior meeting minutes. On the motion, all in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, let's see if we could suspend and take two and three off the table, please. Motion to suspend the rules and take items two and three off motion the table. Motion made and seconded to remove it. Just suspend our uh, rules and uh, take up two items at once. Items two and three. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, first one, DPW and City Engineer provide an update on the potential to sell lots for housing at the top of St. Vincent. And DPW come up with an action plan to collect the litter along both sides of Route 5 from McDonald's to the west side line, and then along both sides of Lower Westfield Road from Northampton Street to the bridge. Um, so, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a few other spots here along Westfield Road from Woodland to Michigan Avenue. And uh, so let's see, we have with this, I understand Michael McManus, the superintendent of the Public Works Department. Ms. McManus? I'm here. Well, that's, that's great. Um, so Mike, uh, can, I, I put these on as uh, kind of placeholders. I know we've had these before. Um, I, I just want, I, I can certainly apprise people on this, but why don't we just go right to you. Tell me what's, uh, with, with agenda item two, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of progress we made to date this is this is regarding the lots that, mm -hmm. item two that's right item two is the uh, item two is a dpw and engineer provide an update on the potential to sell lots for housing at the top of st vincent so the city engineer has prepared a uh a description of the uh what the parcels would be and i believe he's provided that to mayor murphy and at this point in time, it would be up to uh, Mayor Murphy and the school department to uh, work through either putting those uh, parcels out for a bid or doing, a, doing an A&R to separate the parcels so we can go out to bid. But uh, DPW Engineering, we feel that we've taken it as far as we can at this point in time. Well, Mike, that's great. How, how many parcels do we do we? carve up and what do, you, do we know the dimensions I don't have the uh, the dimensions I have that on. okay uh, Councilor Murphy do you want to address us on this point please yeah yeah thank you mr. chairman is your mic on Terry yeah okay I, sorry about can that. you hear me yeah, yeah now, no, now I can, I can. okay now, now I can. Can. usually I can't get too close <laughs> Uh, so first of all city engineer has uh, indicated a number of things and I'll read them to you but we what we are now, this is going to be on the school committee agenda for the August 16th school committee meeting uh, where they'll take it up as to whether or not they have to declare that they're going to give it back to the city, that they don't need it, and the city would have to accept it. Uh, basically, what we're looking at, uh, and I'll give a brief description if, I, if that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Beginning at a point along St. Vincent Street, right of the way line west of the Dean School parking lot, then 160 feet. Uh, westerly along St. Vincent Street, right away line on the northeast corner of the intersection of St. Vincent and Ingleside Street, then northerly a distance of 200 feet alongside Ingleside, along 
the Ingleside Street right-of-way line, then easterly 160 feet parallel to the St. Vincent right-of-way line, and then 200 feet southerly parallel to Ingleside Street right-of-way. It's approximately 32,000 square feet. Uh, and uh, the engineer has provided this information to the chair of the school committee and the receiver, uh, as well as a map of, of the location. Uh, and uh, so it, in, uh, school committee vice chair has agreed to put it on the agenda on August 16th. Uh, with, and, uh, we gave her a little explanation over the weekend as to what we were trying to do. And uh, so they just have to take it up and have the school committee vote to say that they no longer need it for the Dean School, which I'm hoping the Dean, the dean Principal and the Dean uh, uh, Faculty have all said they don't need it. it. It really does them no good and it actually should make it safer for, should we do what we suggested? And the suggestion of the engineer is that at least two street, two houses on St. Vincent Street and potentially one additional one on Ingleside Street, uh, which would clean up that walkway clean up all the fencing that is falling because of, of uh, branches that have fallen, make it much safer for the kids walking up and down, and not to mention the drivers, giving them a much clearer view when they get to the top of uh, St. Vincent Street. So well, there's a lot of good things that could happen. Uh, what, once that happened, obviously we, the city would hopefully solicit bids and hopefully we'd get some uh, contractors that would like to come in and, and see if they could build some homes there. Man, that is uh, some of the best news I've heard in a while. So Terry, uh, I mean, I think we can, uh, if this comes to fruition, we can certainly take some bottles, but I really want to express my gratitude for you take, taking the ball and running with it. Um, so no, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll tell the story once we, when it gets back <laughs> to city council. We're not, we're not gonna tell it now because okay. I told it before. So that's how, it got, how we got here, but it doesn't matter. So, um, okay, uh, do any councilors have uh, questions uh, for? Yeah, I do, Chairman. Uh, 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 Councillor Graney, please. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Acting Mayor Murphy, just a how we, uh, how we just you gonna move the mic up close. A couple of questions. Uh, okay. We mentioned the number of lots and the size of the lots. I don't know if you have that information. And secondly, will the city be able to do any excavation of this project? This, what the goal right now is that should the school department then admit that they don't need it and give it back to the city, the city would solicit proposals. The city would not do the excavating. It would be the developers coming in to do the work. The only thing the city would do at that point is to put it out to bid, uh, see what the options are. The size of the lots, uh, the one lowest towards the parking lot on St. Vincent Street would be the smallest. Uh, the one at the top of St. Vincent and Ingleside would be the largest, and the one on Ingleside Street would be like in between those two. Uh, and that, the engineer has kind of put it together, and uh, this will have no impact on the Dean parking lot. Uh, we're just kind of clearing some brush that it's just kind of had a lot of branches and, and, and trees falling and hit the fence and sticking out onto Ingleside Street as well as St. Vincent Street. So, uh, and if I can, Jeffrey, if you remind me tomorrow, I'll try to send you this map and then you can send it out to the council. Uh, I just don't have that in front of me. Huh? Thank you. Are we any more questions? You said, nope. how we well, sir. Pete, Mike, uh, any other counselors? No? Um, okay, so 32,000 square feet is, is a little north of three, three quarters of an acre. And that's, um, that's pretty exciting, to, uh, Terry. So thanks for that. Okay. Um, all right, that's, uh, that's great news on that one. Um, and then on the other one, back to, um, back to Mr. McManus. Mike, uh, I, I actually t took a ride along, along that route that, uh, here, uh, the online routes that I mentioned. It looks a lot. It looks a lot better. So um, I'm. It's it's looking like we're, we're we're doing some better cleanup on the public ways. But why don't you give me your take on it? Uh, so as as far as within the the right of way, um, we could uh, have Suez sweep that. Um, we could also use our litter vac if there's material that can't be swept up, and uh, larger material we could uh, would have to pick up by hand um, when. When it, it gets into uh, outside of the paved right of way, um, then uh, we, could, we could use the Sheriff's Department of Roca um, or, or others to uh, go in and, and physically remove the trash. All right, I'm glad you mentioned. I'm okay. glad you mentioned we Roca because we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll have Roca, sorry, Mike, uh, we'll, we'll have Roca here. Um, 
I'll, I'll put them on the September agenda for sure to have Roca come in and, and address us. So, um, and uh, and hopefully we'll get the sheriff uh, to come in at some point to give him his proclamation as well. That would be that would be kind of nice to do for uh, for all the good work they've done in cleaning up the city. So hopefully we can get him up uh, in in, uh, in September as well. So all right, thanks, Mike. That's that's great. That's great news on that. Um, I thought it looked a lot better myself, but. So that's just something that, uh, uh, Councilor Murphy, did you want to um, follow up on this? No, I, I agree with you, and I think the the litter vac is, is key, on, especially on Ingleside Street, because some of that gets into that brush, and I know uh, Suez might have a little problem picking that up. But uh, And I also met with Roca last week, and they're also looking to try to get more opportunities. So, But I do think it looks a lot better. Thank you. And yeah. I will say one, one other thing I'd like to thank the DPW for cleaning the... Uh, Island at at uh, what Lower Westfield Road and Ingleside Street. I, I I know it was done recently and it's much clearer. And I've had a, some compliments from people. So thank you, Mike. Yeah, uh, I I'll recognize you a second, uh, Council Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, so Council Murphy, I'm, I'm I am i i could not agree more. Uh, if if I could, just a point of personal privilege. The uh, the traffic island at uh, at Roosevelt and Westfield. Uh, we. So three volunteers, including me, but I'll mention their names in a second, uh, really cleaned it up, and that's that's the POW MIA Memorial, and and then, uh, but I, I do do want to recognize uh, Joe O'Connor for for going from the fire department from on his own time for going above and beyond the call of duty to uh, to really cut down the hay uh, that was there, and it's made that island look a lot better. So I just want to publicly acknowledge uh, Joe O'Connor from the alarm division for. Uh, you know, I just happened to mention it to him, and he just did a beautiful job with it. But uh, Colleen Chesmore and Mark Chattel and myself, uh, four Saturdays ago, we uh, we uh, you know picked up all the trash and uh, and uh, planted flowers and all that. And I thank God Colleen planted them because they're still alive. So um, okay, so uh, uh, with that, uh, Councilor Sullivan wants to be recognized. Mike. Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, through the chair, uh, Mike. Um, do we only have one litter vac? In the fleet? No, we have uh, we have four litter vacs, but typically we have uh, one person uh, operating it at any given time, um, and and that's not always every single day. Uh, we do have uh, guys that come in uh, before their regular shift from five to seven in the morning, and they will vacuum up the the high and maple the downtown. Uh, corridors um, and then sometimes we'll send them out onto Main Street or other other areas around uh, the, the downtown area um, but then if the weather is good and we can we can feel that we will put another one of our staff in it to uh, hit other areas of the city uh, like Dwight Street um, and up on uh, Northampton and, and Beach uh, when when we have personnel available. Okay. But we have uh, four, and the reason we have four is because of the need uh, from road race and parade day. Uh, it really helps out along with the uh, the street sweeping that Suez does uh, to uh, knock down the litter from those events. Okay, so we, but we do have four pieces of equipment. They're all operational right now. It's more of a matter of uh, manpower. Is that a fair Correct. assessment? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, those are, I knew those are pretty, pretty quick. Uh, if, uh, if I could get a motion that they're both complied with, that'd be great. Motion to uh, have items number two and three complied with. Second. Motion is made a second to have two and three complied with on discussion. Hearing none, on the motion, all in favor, aye. aye. Uh, we are joined by Councillor Lisi as well. Welcome, Councillor. Um, let's see. Um, Mike McManus, thank you very much. I believe that's all she wrote for this part of the agenda, anyhow. So, thank you. Um, is Mr. Lavelle here? I see, I see HG&E. Oh, look at this. Wow. Look at this, in a big, big conference room, big table. I wish, wish I could see him. Jeff, how do we, uh, that, that's like a thumbnail. Open it up. H, H, J, and E, say something. 
Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes, we're here. Look at look at this. Oh, look at this crew. Oh boy, that's okay. That's okay. Mr. Mr. Roy's back there. Mr. Roy and Mr. Roy. Oh, oh, this is this is exciting. I'll tell you, I'm not gonna forget this anytime soon. Okay, so uh, so we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna take up because um, I think it makes sense to to take four, five, six. Unless should we take them up as a package? Why don't we just do it as together, I'm right? Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, right. so uh, so we'll, we'll get a motion to suspend, Pete. Motion to suspend and take items number four, five, and six, is it? And seven. And seven, together. <laughs> and and second. motion being a second to suspend and take uh, 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 com combine four items, four, five, six, and seven, under discussion, hearing none on the motion, all in favor, aye. 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 Uh, I'll just qu I'll, I'll bridge the reading, and then we can just go right into it. So. Um, uh, first is or, or uh, invite Jim Lavelle and or the G commissioners to give an update on issues they are presently experiencing, including but not limited to the gas moratorium, renewable energy portfolio, and fiber and broadband internet e e networks. Uh, five, uh, city council and, okay, five is kind of a, uh, well, same thing, and discuss opportunities available for ensuring that we have the natural gas capacity we need to grow. So five is a little bit different than four. Then six, that the city undertake a feasibility study to uh, figure out how to transfer power lines to the underground. The study should seek to understand the costs, obstacles, potential cost savings, impacts on service reliability and on public safety, and to seek out grant funding and other types of funding uh, to see what's available. And then item number seven, the last of the package that the manager and appropriate staff of hg &E be invited to update the council on any findings regarding uh, municipal broadband related costs and potential so some of this is uh, repetitive so i do apologize to GE, &E, but but hopefully it'll uh, hopefully it all um work out to one one discussion so uh, i don't know which how you want to do this councilor lisi did you want to introduce this or do you want to dive into um or, or any of the councilors that made because they're all before us so is Councilor Anderson Burgos with us? Okay, okay, so he's, he's on his way, and Councilors, oh, I'm here, and then uh, Councilor, uh, Councilor Murphy as well. But, um, I, I mean, I, I think maybe the, the best way is to have the HG&E officials, why don't we take them one at a time? We'll, we'll start with item four, and, and you know, why don't you give us your perspective on that, and then perhaps we can follow up with some questions, and then we'll, then we'll just proceed in chronological order, okay? Council Bartley. I hear, yes. Oh, Council Lisa, yes. Thank you. Um, I wonder if it makes sense to just go topic by topic because some, like you mentioned, a lot of these orders overlap one another, so maybe we could just take up, you know, one topic and then ask questions, one topic and then ask questions amongst um, gas moratorium, renewable energy, fiber, and internet. I think, I feel like those are the three big topics there and then all the other sort of sub well, I, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to miss anything. So what, let's let's hit item four, and we'll take the topics that are there. And if and if we go to uh, subsequent items and they're repetitive, we don't we, we don't we know we covered it. So um, so we're at item four, and uh, let's see the the we've got uh, gas moratorium, renewable energy portfolio, and the fiber and broadband internet networks. So, Lady and gentlemen, why don't we why don't, why don't we hear from you on, on, on item four? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll start with uh, an update on the gas moratorium. The uh, as you're aware, the moratorium's been in place since January 2019. Um, it is our top priority uh, to do everything we can to lift the moratorium, but we still, you know, the, the the best solution would be for us to get access to more natural gas supply uh, into the city. To, to be able to lift that, but uh, that hasn't happened, uh, and there's no uh, imminent solution in that regard. So we're aggressively trying to uh, push the energy conservation and energy efficiency to try to reduce uh, consumption and pick up, you know, some capacity gains in that regard. So we're going to continue to to work it as uh, as hard as we can, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have much progress to report. Uh, as far as lifting the moratorium tonight. Okay, and, and, and Jim, though I know everybody at the table, would you just give us a, just a quick synopsis of who's at the table with you? So Jim Lavelle, the manager, who's the 
the, the head of the Gas and Electric spoke first. And Jim, why don't you introduce the, your colleagues, please? Yes, thank you. So I have uh, Kate uh, Sullivan Craven, who's our Director of Marketing and Communications. I have uh, Steve Roy, who's our Electric Superintendent, and uh, Brian Roy, who's our Gas Division Superintendent. How those two ever rose to those positions, we'll, we'll, we'll never know, but that's another story for another day. Um, okay, so uh, let's see here. Um, can I ask questions on that point? Yes, you can. Gas moratorium questions. Fire away. Councilor thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, from the GE for joining us today and answering these questions. I think there are um, a lot of questions out in the public um, in terms of why we have a gas moratorium and how it could potentially be listed, lifted. Um, so I think just for the public's sake, it helps um, if we could explain, um, you know, in layperson's terms, uh, why do we have the gas moratorium presently and how would we lift it? Who, who would be in charge or in control of, of lifting it? So uh, the moratorium was imposed by the HGE and Commission uh, and it would be lifted uh, by the HGE and Commission. Uh, and we have a moratorium because there's not enough gas supply to meet the, safely meet the demand on a peak winter day. Right now our peak day is in the winter, the coldest days of the winter. So uh, in round numbers, you know, our pipeline capacity is uh, about 12,000 decatherms a day. And on a winter day, we're um, pulling uh, our system demands about 20,000 decatherms. So we have a peaking plant with LNG uh, capacity that has to carry about half of the city load on a peak day. And that's not a reliable or safe uh, situation to be running the, the, the plant at that level for extended periods. So the, the solution again is getting more capacity uh, either on the pipeline or somewhere some other way into the city. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question, um, oh, yeah, Council Bartley? You have Thank you. Floor. Um, do you have a rough number of how much, um, I'm not sure what the unit of measurement would be, but how much capacity do we need to free up in order to lift the moratorium? Our target is 5,000 decatherms of gain. On and a that, peak day, yeah. And, and do you think that is um, possible to achieve through efficiencies um, and conservation? I know that, for example, the, uh, I'm sorry, I forget which school it is, but they have a big boiler that's going to be replaced that would um, increase um, efficiency there. Um, so, you know, is 5,000 decatherms something that is a, a feasible target? If so, is there a timeline for when we might reach that target? It, it's, it will be a long time if we're going to get there by efficiency alone. I mean, the average home uses about a decatherm on a peak day. So, you know, you're talking 5,000 homes converting to electrification, which we're pushing, but, you know, it's going to take a long time to get that number of conversions. Uh, you know, the municipal load in the aggregate is uh, about 1,000 decatherms. Yeah. On, on a peak day. So, you know, we're, we're looking at all possible contributions to, to getting there. Um, again, you know, the energy efficiency is the one that we have, you know, uh, most control over right now. So we're, we're pushing that as hard as we can. And we will continue to look at commercial and industrial loads that may be targets, uh, including, including municipal buildings, uh, where, where we can, mm -hmm. you know, help with, with converting and freeing up that load. So it's, it's nothing that we are seeing a horizon for at this point in time. Um, if we were looking for that target of 5,000 decatherms, it doesn't seem that um, in this year or even the next five years, we would, we would likely hit it. We do not have a solution that would be in play within three years, I think it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, and then, one last final wrap, wrap up question here. So um, I know at one point in time, uh, one of the providers, and I, I forget which one it was, whether it was Columbia or Tennessee, I, I apologize. Um, they were interested in uh, increasing the diameter of the pipeline so that we could get more um, product into this area. Um, I, I 
wonder if there is any interest of renewing that conversation or if given the sort of climate um, goals that the state has, if that's changed the incentive structure and um, it doesn't seem likely that whatever company that was would be interested in, in expanding gas capacity because of the direction that the, the state is going at this point in time. So we, we did have a solution uh, with Columbia at the time that would have uh, helped us avoid imposing the moratorium. Uh, they have now uh, been purchased by Eversource. Mm -hmm. So Eversource is right now in the middle of their Greater Springfield Reliability Project. We have talked with them, but they're, they're uh, so occupied with that project that they, they you know, it's not an option in, in the near future. And is, I'm sorry, if I, if I may, um, through the chair. Um, is there any um, opportunity for public pressure to help activate their interest and perhaps put it on their agenda? Or is that something that they wouldn't necessarily be responsive to? No, they've been responsive. There's no public pressure needed right now. Okay, thank you. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, thank you, and again through the chair, Mike. Uh, just we got to move that mic all the way up there because it, it's not going through the speaker. Okay. Uh, again through the through the chair, uh, Jim. If if we were to go ahead and replace the one mile uh, of bottleneck we have in the pipe, would would that be incentive to get EverSource faster to the table or to take us more seriously? I, I, and we could certainly do that, Councillor, but I, I don't think it's an issue. You know, I, as I mentioned, Eversource has been responsive. Uh, we have had conversations with them. It's just a matter of the, it's a large project that they've got going in Springfield right now and um, a very difficult permitting process as well. So they are fully, um, you know, committed right now with all their resources to, to getting that done before they can take on any additional work. Okay. So, um Aside from their Springfield project, um, there are some other obstacles down the line, even if we had that pipe replaced, upgrades they would have to make in other cities or somewhere down the line? Yeah, well, you know, we haven't gotten into great detail with them on what, what an approach would be, if they would view it the same way that uh, Columbia did or not. but. In the Columbia plan, there, there was work in West Springfield and Agawam, I believe, to, that they would have had to have done to effect that solution. Okay, and, and right now that's because so I, of the Springfield project, there's nothing going on with any of that? Uh, it's all fallen by the wayside right now? Yes. Well, I mean, there's, again, that, that Greater Springfield Reliability Project has work in, in Longmeadow, Agawam, uh, Springfield, it, at least. So it, it's a very large project. Okay. And the, the last I knew, the, the, there was another uh, pipeline into Hoyoke through East Hampton, I believe. Well, the, the other line that we've discussed uh, is an upgrade to the Northampton lateral, which is Tennessee gas uh, asset. And that, that is uh, cost prohibitive at the moment uh, because there's uh, Hoyoke would be the only one stepping up the plate, uh, up to the plate to pay for that order of magnitude. Is, uh, so you're talking, you know, around $80 million for, for them to do that. And that, that was an estimate. It wasn't a firm quote. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for the manager or this just, on, on this topic? Councilor Graney. Just quickly, uh, Mr. Lavelle, is there any procedure at all to bring that three-year exclusion closer? Uh, we, we'd love to be able to, Councilor, but we, again, we, we don't have a, a... If we could get close to the, to the five, I mean, we would be at a point where we would recommend lifting the moratorium, but, um, you know, we're making progress with our energy efficiency gains, but I mean, we're talking in the the hundred decatherm range rather than a thousand even. So we're, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of work for us to 
and, and we're going to continue to push the conservation and energy efficiency. So we'll know better, um, I, I think, in another year's time as some more of the uh, conservation gains are, are tallied up. Thank you. Can I just ask one question? Councilor Welcome. Murphy. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Jim, can you just give us an idea as to, since this moratorium, uh, how many new businesses and or people trying to build homes have been unable to get gas? And then if there's, an, if there's a number to that, and if possible also, uh, how many of them came and ended up using something like propane or something along that lines? Yeah, so we, we're aware of just over 200 requests for service that we had to deny, and, and there have been some businesses in there. Uh, we're, we're also confident that, you know, because it's known out in the, in the valley that there's a gas moratorium here, that we probably lost some business opportunities that never knock on our door. Um, of the 200, we, the, the conversions or customers that have either stayed on oil or uh, use propane there's about a hundred yeah. and so you know yeah that, that's unfortunate because those are much dirtier fuels so and, it, and they're more more costly than the natural gas at the time so we're having to say no to customers forcing them to you know burn dirtier fuels at a higher expense and again we're losing some business opportunities so from an economic development standpoint it, it's it's not a good outcome to date Okay, thank you for that information. Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jim, everybody, welcome. Um, Jim, when it comes to homeowners and, and energy um, audits and energy conservation, does the gas and electric still offer a low-cost um, analysis of a homeowner and what they can do to, uh, to save on energy? Yes, uh, Councillor, we do that. And in fact, we require a free energy audit for customers that want to take advantage of our uh, zero interest uh, loan program to, to make some of these improvements because we want to make sure that they're you know, spending the money uh, on, on the right improvements to, to get the best energy efficiency gains. Is that still include furnace replacement or? Yeah, yes, Councillor, it does. In, in fact, we just, Kate just reminded me that we uh, increased the uh, incentive, uh, we doubled it uh, for certain qualifying uh, energy efficiency or conservation measures. When it comes to industrial commercial property, has the gas and electric uh, looked to see if there's any potential abusers out there or property or uh, businesses that could use your help to, uh, to take some conservation uh, steps? Yes, and we have um, a person dedicated to our larger customers that uh, that's the key function for that individual to keep tabs on those accounts and to see where there might be some um, opportunities to help them uh, improve efficiency or conserve energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I think I have one more question. Council Lacey. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any model programs um, across the state or even the U.S. where, um, you know, a, a light and power company would pair up with a building owner and see if they could do a, a wholesale conversion um, so that we're, we're bringing, I know a couple of the new buildings that have been built, built here um, have put electric in from the start, and I think that's a really great um, sort of uh, step forward in terms of the efficiencies that we're looking for and the and the savings, but I'm just wondering if there, um, if there's model programs out there. I don't know if there's um, funding or grants that could um, help us identify full residential buildings that um, we could then assist in making that conversion to from natural gas to electric. I don't know if there's a model program out there, but we're familiar with you know a number of test cases either for utility companies um, that are, you know, looking at alternative heating solutions. So we're, we're keeping a close eye on those. We just completed a study with the Rocky Mountain Institute to better understand heat pumps and, and where they um, can be effectively deployed. Um, and, and, you know, in a cold weather environment, you have to be careful not to force a solution that's not going to work on a peak winter day for a customer. So um, we, we learned a bit from that study and it's helped us 
in, in our promotion of uh, those alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, so let's see. The next uh, item within this order uh, looks so renewable energy portfolio. Jim, do you want to talk about that? Sure, I'm not really sure what kind of information uh, the committee is looking for, Mr. Chairman, but I can tell you that um, you know the state has passed a climate bill uh, at the beginning of this year, it was signed by the governor with targets to uh, be net zero in as far as electric emissions go by 2050. So, uh, and there are interim targets in 2030 and 2040. Uh, right now, we are fully compliant with the requirements in the climate bill, and we are actually uh, ahead of plan until uh, you get to about 2035 at this point. So, you know, we're fortunate to have our hydro assets locally here that uh, provide much of our renewable energy. Um, getting from 2035 to 2050 is going to be interesting because we don't know what solutions are going to be available for us, but we, we know we, we're not gonna, there's not enough real estate in Holyoke to develop that much solar to meet our targets. Um, and, and again, looking at the other alternatives, wind, the same thing. Uh, it would be difficult to get that kind of capacity um, in, in this area. So we're likely to be um, complementing our current portfolio with assets that are to be, uh, to be determined at this point. But, you know, we're, we're frankly concerned about cost as well as we move up the curve or get closer to that meeting that mandate. A uh, recent MIT study suggested that the cost of energy uh, is going to be at least three times and maybe up to five times what customers are paying right now uh, as, as you get closer to those targets. So we're, we're currently compliant with the uh, requirements of the renewable portfolio standard. Our costs uh, continue to be competitive uh, and, and we'll continue to focus on compliance as well as cost. Any follow-up questions on this topic? Uh, so Lisi? Thank you. Um, so I know that the state is also entertaining uh, a new building code similar to the stretch codes that we passed in 09 that brought us up to um, the present standards that we're, we're using. Um, do you, I, I'm just wondering if you, if you think that that's going to impact the portfolio standard in any way or is the portfolio standard really sort of uh, where you're generating your energy from and it's not going to necessarily be impacted by the type of construction and building construction that we do in the city? I, I don't see a tie to the um, code in, in our portfolio. It might no. require less energy, I guess. Our, the, as we did our long-term uh, outlook for our portfolio, we have uh, assumed that our load will increase uh, due to electric vehicles um, around 2030, in addition to an increase of electrification of homes uh, between starting really in 2030 time period as it becomes more readily available and um, a little bit more consumer knowledgeable as to what's out there. So as Jim mentioned, we are, we are good through uh, 2035. Um, and as we get into that 2035 to 2050 period, some of our long-term contracts will either need to be renewed or we'll have to source uh, some alternative contracts. If I could follow up. Um, so I guess w one of the things that I'm trying to figure out here is if we um, have more buildings that are using green energy sources, um, or at least electric, um, what kind of pressure does that put on the g and &E to um, keep up with the portfolio of standards that you need to achieve? Is it totally unrelated? I mean, I, I am sort of asking from the outside here, but I, I would imagine that there is a link. I'm just trying to understand how much pressure that puts up on you guys to come up with that, um, to meet the load and also meet the renewable standards that the state is pressing. Well, I think the, the, the quicker people start to turn to electric heating and electric devices, as Steve mentioned, the more power we're going to need to supply them. So. You know, right now, I, I don't see us, you know, even if, you know, a lot of people started a new construction that was uh, fell under the stretch code, 
Um, it, it might impact us, but I think it's more going to, as far as having to buy more power, that would impact the portfolio and maybe cause us to have to, you know, buy, you know, renewable energy sources. But I think the, the more immediate impact is going to be, um, you know, the, the improvements that have to be made to the electric distribution system. Uh, uh, I you know, if, if we go full electrification by 2050, we're looking at well over $100 million dollars of improvements to make just to, to the distribution system. And do those improvements fall upon the MLP or some other entity? Upon our customers. As do the costs for any of the other compliance requirements in the climate bill. But, but you have the capacity to make those distribution improvements. It's not some other entity that would be making those improvements to the grid. It would be the gas and electric itself. Yes. Thank you. Council Sullivan. Yep. Uh, through the chair, uh, Jim, as, as far as our uh, hydro capacity goes, do we, have, do we have an opportunity there to expand on that at all? I think I'm gonna let Steve Pick this. I think the short answer, Councillor, is no. But if you want more detail, I can have Steve uh, chime in. Yeah, we've we've done studies that based on the flow duration curve, so the amount of water that comes throughout the year, um, it really is what's determined to be cost prohibitive. It's prohibitive to uh, add any large scale generation that would really tip the needle one way or another. So we've focused primarily. Over the last 15 years of trying to uh, make efficiency upgrades at all the different hydro plants, and we have received additional output from the existing stations we have uh, by doing those type of upgrades. So we'll be able to continue to get small gains, but nothing material. Like we're not going to double capacity uh, from the system at any point. So um, further down the line, like at the Riverside station, um, we wouldn't have enough flow down there to add a hydro unit uh, and you know you mentioned you know costs and stuff is there anything the city could do to help with that if it was possible there there might be an opportunity as some of the units on that same level of the canal uh, you know require upgrades um, you, so yeah, and we continue to look at that. So th there may be an opportunity at Riverside Station to add, add a little bit of capacity, but I mean, you're, you're talking in the probably three to five megawatt range rather than, you know, 10 to 20 megawatts. Okay, and um, as far as the dam itself, uh, as I understand it, we're, we're kind of tied up by the, um, by the EPA or, or the state on that as far as adding any uh, capacity there? Yeah, and, and as Steve mentioned, we've looked at the flow duration curves and to, to put a third unit, I mean, a third unit has been talked about ever since, you know, the city uh, thought about um, going out their license 20 plus years ago. But um, it, it hasn't, it's proven to be cost prohibitive at, at this point. And, and maybe technically in, unfeasible. Okay, thank you. Councillor Murphy. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jim, I just want to make sure I heard correctly. If I heard that you said that the price of energy for the consumer would be somewhere between three and five times the amount if uh, in 2050 or 2035 uh, as we go through this process? That, that's according to a recent MIT study, yes. Okay. And since obviously this is uh, being promoted for, for, for good reasons, but promoted, so are, are we not talking, or is, is the state or federal government not providing uh, financial upgrades so that the consumer, when it comes time, the consumer is somewhat living with the, the same economic situation it is? I mean, I'm just looking at my own case. If, you, if that were the case and not counting inflation, I could go from 6,000 to 30,000 in terms of my energy cost to, to take care of my house. Obviously that would be uh, unbearable for most people. 
impossible for some. Right. So. Yeah. Right, and and that's why we're very concerned about that. You know, the cost impact of complying with these requirements. And that was so. When I said the energy cost, your your total bill, um, you know, includes distribution and transmission, uh, as well as the energy. So right now, if if you, half of your electric bill is you know ballpark. Yep. is the energy piece of that. Okay, thank you. And, and I, yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions on this topic? One last question. I'll surely see. Thank you. Um, I'm on the MIT um, energy website and I would just love if you could tell us which study that is. I'd, I'd love to take a, a look at it. I'll have to follow up with you. Oh, sure, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll follow up uh, with the MIT study. Jeff, if you would connect with Count, uh, Ms. LaBelle, get that to Councilor Lisi. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, let's see, fiber and broadband internet networks. And I know Kate Sullivan would like to talk about that because I saw that in the paper today that we've got a big survey. Kate Craven, I'm sorry. Kate Craven wants to talk about that today. So, uh, um, so um, Kate, why don't you tell us a little bit about the survey and, um, and where we are, and then, and then we'll turn it over to whomever about the broadband, et cetera. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for having us. Um, we just completed a three-month interest campaign for fiber to the home. As you all know, there was a referendum question in 2019 um, and a lot of activity around broadband and conversations around broadband throughout the pandemic. Um, and at the end of last year, we decided that we would move forward doing an interest campaign. Uh, we did some aggressive marketing and reached out to our constituents, sent um, notices in the bill flyers and did, you know, as you, you saw a media release. Um, and we tried to reach out to every customer in the city of Playa so that they would have a chance to respond and let us know if they were interested in a potential fiber service. So we received approximately a thousand interest forms um, from our customers throughout the city. Um, and our goal was to understand the interest and also to understand kind of where the interest lies so we would be able to potentially map out um, a, a pilot if it seemed like um, it would be a good opportunity to move forward with any sort of fiber service. Um, we know that the cost of fiber to the home is approximately $30 million. Um, and again, here we are talking about, you know, renewable energy and several other items that are going to cost our ratepayers over time. So we are moving forward very cautiously as we study, stutter, stutter, <laughs> as I stutter and we study fiber to the home. Um, we just want to make sure that we're taking a very intentional approach and we understand exactly what the ratepayer wants before we just move forward. Um, with something that would be nice to have. Um, so I'm sure you've all seen the interest form and had a chance to fill it out if, if you were interested and shared it with your constituents. Um, so that's kind of where we are. We're going to do some, some um, analysis of the data that we've received and take it from there. Hopefully have a report this fall that will be publicly available so people can kind of see what type of input that we received from the community. And what's the deadline to submit it was Friday the 23rd, um, but we do have the interest form live on the website still, and it'll stay up just so in case customers kind of their interest trickles in. We just want to make sure they have an opportunity to express interest, even though the campaign has wrapped up. Thank you, Kate. Um, gentlemen, did you want to add anything before we turn to questions? No. Nope. Any questions nope. on this topic from anyone? Councilor Lisi? Thank you. Thanks so much for all the information that you're sharing with us this evening. Um, I have a few questions. Did you have a, a target goal for the number of responses that would have been ideal? So at, um, if, if we had a 40% take rate throughout the city of Polio, customers that would be potentially eligible to take the service, so a 40% take rate at $100 a month, so customers are willing to spend $100 a month, it would become, the fiber network would become profitable in 10 years. 
So that was one of our, during our pro forma stage when we were kind of looking at the analysis of the financials, that is kind of a target number that we looked at um, to help guide us and understand how much interest we would potentially need. And by uh, fiber so, network available within 10 years, do you mean um, citywide, the entire city would be covered at that point in time? Yes. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say that. The $30 million um, number is, for, is not including multi-dwelling units because every single multi-family building kind of has its own um, layout and, you know, its own nuances. So, we just, so those would be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. We obviously have three pilot programs right now, one at the Cubit Building, one at Russell Terrace, and one at um, Chestnut Park Apartments. And those were all done during either development or redevelopment of those buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so it made it a little more financially feasible to put the infrastructure in those, those facilities. Um, okay, uh, still, I do want to make sure I understand um, this statement about for, if we get a 40% take rate at $100 a month, then we would have um, the fiber network available. And does that still include a hole for the multifamily dwelling units? Or d would that include the multifamily dwelling units? That does not include multifamily dwelling units. Okay. Okay. Um, so from there, I have heard from uh, a lot of constituents because I have been pushing the you know, people to take the poll. I do think it's really important for folks to participate in that survey that was going around um, because it's a, you know, the chance that we're getting at the moment to let you all know that we are interested and folks in the city do want to become part of that take rate. Um, however, the, the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of constituents is that it feels a little bit like a push poll um, where um, there was a lot of emphasis on how difficult it would be to, um, transition from your current cable provider to the fiber network, um, different equipment. So there was a lot of um, barriers presented. And um, additionally, uh, I know that there were different rates being presented to see where people would feel comfortable. Um, but it, I also saw in the ARPA funds proposal that you were looking to do um, use some ARPA funds to um, understand network design poll readiness. Um, and I'm not sure if that's just for the 100 household fiber hood or if, you know, the, the, the $100 a month costs would be altered in some way, shape, or form based on th this study that you're um, asking to be funded at this point in time. Okay, so I think there's two put, like questions there. So one is we designed that questionnaire very, very intentionally, and it wasn't. It's not really a survey. It's more of an interest form, and we wanted people when they answered the questions to really understand what they were answering, um, almost like a test marketing campaign because we feel that this technology is a shift from what people are used to, and we just want to make sure that when people are filling out the questionnaire they understand kind of what they're saying yes to. Um, when it comes to the ARPA application, we did apply for, um, I'm sorry. Um, we applied for make ready for the whole city and a full network design. Uh, those are currently in our pro, the $30 million pro forma. Um, and so obviously if we were to receive any sort of funding through ARPA or potentially this infrastructure bill that's being debated right now, um, the analysis and pro forma would change mm -hmm. based on whatever um, whatever those those dollars look like. Um, and Kate, I'm going to ask you to um, just repeat yourself, just because I'm having a little bit of uh, trouble catching everything that you're saying through the technology. It's no one's fault here. It's just the the technology is um, causing a little bit of feedback in the way that I'm hearing things. So. Um, the ARPA application that you have in here, is that limited to the pilot neighborhood? Okay. No, no. The ARPA application includes uh, the full design of the network. That would be citywide. The make ready would also be citywide. And then the pilot 
uh, would be a half wireless, half fiber pilot, um, and those would be in the qualifying census tract. Mm -hmm. the, the reason for the pilot is that, you know, some of the MDUs or all the MDUs are, are not included in the estimate, and some of them would be difficult to wire, maybe cost prohibitive to wire. So we're just looking to see if, you know, if we can pilot to test a, a wireless to see if it would be effective in some of these MDUs, as we call them, uh, rather than a fiber solution. Okay, so the, the $15 million price tag is for the full network um, and to see how that would impact that $30 million pro forma. So we applied for $3.5 in this first round of the ARPA funds, and it basically said to set a target for what you could potentially apply for in the second round. So we were not applying for $15 million. We were applying for $3.5 million okay. for this round with, with the potential of applying for a full 15 at the end. Mm -hmm. Right. But we and realize there are many, many um, other valuable projects within the ARPA application, so um, we are certainly not trying to take more than, than our share. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification um, in terms of um, where that $3.5 million would be applied and how, how, it, how it would be applied. Um, I know that when we got the guidance for the ARPA funds, it really carved out, um, you know, broadband and fiber internet is something that we should invest in. And I think these, th this one of the uh, legacy projects that the federal government is in many ways asking municipalities to um, use the ARPA funds for. So I would, I would very much be in favor in being able to cut into that $30 million price tag um, with the application of ARPA funds. Um, perhaps not at this point in time because it seems like you're still getting um, some of the true costs in order, um, but down the road, it's something I would definitely like to support and move forward on. Thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you, Council Lisa. Sorry about that. Um, I'll be right back. Uh, okay, on broadband, Council Sullivan. Yep. Thank you. So, let me, uh, if I understand, uh, I want to be right on the point of this. 30 million dollar investment and it's going to take a, f a five year build out if we had the 30 million right now and started today I think that's fair yes and it's going to take 10 years for it to become profitable is that what I heard earlier also it, it, yeah it's, assuming you have about a 40 percent take rate and everybody's willing to spend $100 a month. At about $100 a month. And that's assuming we get a 40% take rate, that the competition doesn't lower its price. or uh, the other, But more than the competition lowering its price, which is a good thing, the, what are the chances of the technology in 10 years being obsolete and we haven't invested $30 million and, and used these funds for something uh, that, like many other advances we see coming along, seem to happen at a much rapider pace, that this is just obsolete technology even five years from now. There's definitely a, a technology risk. Um, about 20 years ago, HG&E was looking at uh, a cable TV build-out. You know, that technology is obsolete today so you know you're right so we have to be careful in selecting the right technology uh, as we move forward and I, and I think we're going to be watching that very closely uh, moving forward okay thank you okay thank you councillor Sullivan uh, any other councillors on broadband at this point, I don't see anybody with their hands up. Okay. Oh, and we are joined by Councillor Anderson Burgos and Councillor McGee on the computer. Welcome to you both. Uh, okay. So moving forward to uh, 
Let's see, item five, city council invite and commissioners appropriate update. Uh, okay, natural gas moratorium, dis discuss the opportunities available for ensuring that we have the natural gas capacity we need. To okay, I, Council Lisi, I think those were covered in the prior discussion, would you agree? Okay, thank you. Okay, so item six, that the city of Holyoke undertake a feasibility study to figure out how to transfer power lines to the underground. We need a study for that, do we know how to do that? I, I hope we know how to do that. The study should seek to understand the costs, the obstacles, the potential cost savings, the impacts on service reliability and on public safety, and to seek what grants and other types of funding are available. So, so we do have the makers of the order here on, on, on the Zoomer, um, and the way we've done this, gentlemen, we're, we're gonna hear from uh, the round table there at, at 99 Suffolk Street, and then we're going to turn it over to, to you two if you wanna have a follow-up question with them. So 99 Suffolk Street, why don't you address what's happening in, in, a, in agenda item six? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll start it off and then uh, Steve will correct me or uh, add to um, the, the high level view. So um, in general, we, we support, you know, the, the, the tone of that order because, we, you know, other things being equal, we'd like to have everything underground. All new construction is pretty much underground um, today. Reconstruction is on a case by case basis, but cost is the real issue. Um, as you know, you're usually looking at a factor of three to four times the cost and uh, in, in more sometimes to go underground uh, than the, the standard overhead design. And if we looked at the entire city, you know, you're talking our, about 300 million. We have a detailed estimate, but the roll up is about $300 million to um, underground the facilities that we have in place today. Uh, and, and that's, again, we mentioned earlier that just the investment that's going to be required in the distribution system to meet the electrification growth is going to be in the order of $100 million. So the $300 million, if we finance that over 20 years, that would be $20 million a year additional expense for the principal and interest uh, service on the bond. And we would save, there's a savings in tree trimming of uh, about three quarters of a million dollars a year, but you're still well north of $20 million additional expense that would have to be picked up by the customers. So, you know, it, it, again, we continue to look at a case by case basis when we're reconstructing, but uh, to do the entire system uh, at this point, I, I think it would break the backs of the customers. Okay, and, and uh, uh, Ms. Lavelle, the, okay, so, just as to the feasibility study, I, I, I mean, I, th I think I don't. I think I know the counselors know you know how to do this. I'm, I'm just being flippant, but um, but if it's how to put them underground. But so when you say the, these numbers have, have that, that sounds to me as though you've you've conducted an, that the HGE has conducted analysis on this very topic in the in the past. So how what how how recent would would, would that analysis have been? It was updated when the order was uh, filed um, February. back wow. in February. Wow, cutting edge from the G&E, doesn't shock me, cutting edge. Okay, so uh, to the makers of the order, what say you? What's your pleasure? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this was a discussion that I wanted to bring to the table and it's obvious that it's not a right away. It's not like turning on and off a switch. This is something that I thought that over the years. So if it's new um, construction, that that construction would add the underground to start, you know, to start the beginning process of what the city would look like. And for me, like, you know, one savings is like you said, is the cutting of the trees and stuff, the trimming of the trees and so on and so forth. But another huge impact. And when I, when I say impact, I'm looking at like seasonal, right? So we have a lot of outages, um, especially during the winter. Um, and there's been accidents where cars hit poles and then you have a whole few streets out for, you know, with light, and especially in the winter, if that happens, people rely on electricity for heat. Um, and I'm just looking at this as not right away, but something to keep on the table, to keep having this discussion until we find a solution or a way to, to actually have the city uh, fully operational underground as you know with the poles and, and so on and so forth 
Um, Terry, do you have anything to weigh in on? If I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, just is, is does Councillor McGee want to speak in this matter? I don't see his hand up, so I don't I don't know how to. Councillor Murphy. Okay, th thank you. And uh, so I, I I also think it has some potential, and I certainly think, uh, and I, this is where I would like to to check to see if there is some savings. If when it, we're doing a road project and you're getting ready to do some wiring, uh, if that makes sense. I know there was, at Valley Heights, I know we're talking about some cost savings because we're all working together. And that's, from a long-term perspective, that would be an excellent way for the entire city to do projects so that every all departments that are gonna have some work are, are gonna be able to take care of it at the same time. Uh, I do, also think in when we got new construction, it would make sense if that's possible. I would assume if we're talking new construction, the cost might be less than it would be when we're trying to do a repair job. Would that be correct? Correct. When it's uh, new construction, the costs are borne by the developer. Whereas when it's reconstruction, we, okay. you know, the ratepayers are picking up the cost. Okay. And what, just in terms of when we do have an outage, and, and let me say, we're lucky to have oil, gas, and electric because I look at all these other communities and they're down for 24 hours, 48, 48 hours, 72 hours, and we're down for you know 28 minutes sometimes. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, but uh, you know, could we be in a position, uh, or what savings do we make if, in fact, we have a storm that knocks down the power? I mean. I'm assuming we're paying pretty significant amounts of overtime and other factors uh, as we try to get lines back up. Uh, is there, there's probably no standard, but is there an average uh, in terms of the cost when we have a, a power line that goes down and we have to get it back up? So in our analysis, we had figured we would save roughly about 50,000 a year for non-weather related events. That cause outages, and probably about another sixty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars per year from weather-related events. Okay, so um, obviously a lot if, less than the twenty million. <laughs> overhead and underground. Okay, all right. I mean, and I, also, I just long term, it also probably would look better, but that's another matter. So I, I appreciate the information. Obviously, the cost right now is prohibitive, but if we find out there's other opportunities, or if we find out work is being done, uh, that could reduce the cost of doing things as you get into repairs. I'd certainly be interested in seeing uh, what those costs might be at that point. Thank you. And I understand that Councilor McGee has his hand up. Councilor McGee. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry I'm not down there. I was at the uh, hospital today for a procedure, so I'm a little, little slow today, but thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I'm just going to say exactly what uh, Councillor Anderson Burgos and Councillor Murphy said is if there's ways that we can find to cut costs over time as projects do come available to see if we can put things underground. I, I know the price tag was high. I knew it way back when, but it's trying to be proactive to see what opportunities we have going forward in attack in that fashion. You know, Northampton Street. Uh, supposedly there is a bond bill coming in, you know, in a couple of years to uh, kind of rehab that. Are the ways to attack uh, putting lines in the ground when that project comes due? And if so, what do we have to do to achieve that? So we know we're not going to do a two, three hundred million dollar tomorrow. Hit the switch, not not happening. But as things slowly develop, if we can attack them, you know, piecemeal to ultimately get to a better position, that we start chipping away at the two, three hundred thousand dollar mark. It makes it something that we should look at. So I appreciate the committee taking this up. It's just to start the discussion and keep it fresh as to why it is important to attack this issue. Because I'll remind people my first day on the job when I was mayor, citywide blackout. Citywide. First day on the job. So it does happen. Uh, luckily, you know, uh, Jim Lavelle and his group got it fix quickly and I can't thank you enough but you know it's something that we have to stay on top of so thank you okay oh, okay Councilor Sullivan yep uh, thank you and again through the chair uh, Jim the numbers we had on the uh, fiber build out of 30 million did that envision putting anything underground uh, Councilor right yes 
it did. Um, we have about 30% of our system that's underground currently. So um, some of the fiber build would, would, would follow the same path uh, as the electric cable in most cases. So there, there's about 25 to 30% uh, that would be underground in the estimate. And then as far as the elimination of poles, um, unless Verizon or Comcast went along with it, the poles would still be sitting out there? Correct. Okay, thank you. And I'm glad Councilor Sullivan brought up that point because that's, and uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that, uh, or confirming that, Mr. Roy, I'm not sure what, uh, appreciate Steve Roy, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm just going to make my, my two cents. When, when we lost power October 29th, 2011, I lost it for three hours, three total hours. And, uh, and uh, everyone from out of town was complaining about Holyoke. Well, guess what? They all lined up in droves at Kmart Plaza, filling their gas tank. There were lines wrapped around Denny's. Now, where, when, when have you seen that? Never. Um, uh, and there are <laughs> lines everywhere. Everybody who complains about Holyoke, we're all there, you know, sucking off our power to, to try to fill their gas tank and fill their stomachs with, uh, with uh, a Grand Slam <laughs> breakfast. So, so, they're, they're, so, so there's that, okay? Um, so we, we don't lose, when we lose power, it's not for, not for very long. So we thank the G&E as, as per usual. So I think, uh, I don't think I miss anybody. I I think, uh, yeah, uh, Joe, uh, Joe, uh, just don't don't lose me, Joe. I just want to look at is, is that the manager and appropriate staff. Okay, seven is kind of repetitive too, so that's kind of where we are. Yeah. Councilor McGivern, sorry. Thank Joe. you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be uh, quick and uh, frank and to the point. Um, I, I think we'd all love to see our electrical wires and poles disappear and go underground. Three hundred million dollars is a lot of project. In fairness, it has to be a rollout that would be offered to the entire city. In fairness, $20 million a year to finance it on the back of the ratepayers is a deal breaker. You just, you can't do it. And I think in, in honesty, the, the ratepayers understand that as much as we like to see it. But thank you for looking at it. And uh, unfortunately, it's just cost prohibitive. Yeah, I want, I want to echo that statement, but I, I do want to point out uh, the agenda item that, that uh, agenda item Oh my God, yeah, I can read. Um, agenda item two, so that, that's, that's gonna be uh, a potentially a, a very small development, but a new development and see what happens. Yeah, maybe, maybe that would be something that, that a potential developer who, who's interested in all three lots uh, would, would entertain. I, I don't know, but, but if, even if you piecemeal it, to do the whole city at one fell swoop, clearly cost prohibitive, but, but perhaps there's a way to to piecemeal it over time, and, and maybe maybe the G I, I, I think it's a valid order, but the, the, the G&E could maybe, um, if it made sense, I don't know if it makes sense to piecemeal it, but if it did, maybe maybe that would be a way to to sort of tackle the problem. Okay, uh, anything else from any other counselors on the G&E who have been very generous with their time? Uh, so. Seven's all set, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Pete, Pete, yeah. Pete mentioned, because a lot of these are repetitive, but they're, but four, five, six, and seven, I, I think we can say if the counselors are okay, that they're all complied with. Yep. Are we okay yep. with that? Yep. The counselors, uh, counselors uh, Anderson, Burgos, and McGee, you're okay with that? Here's to wishful thinking. <laughs> oh, okay, so we'll- Thank we'll, you, guys. Thank you, thank you, uh, HG&E uh, crew. Thank you so much. Great I really appreciate thanks. you, you and your services. Thank you. Yeah. I'll make a motion to um, state that items four, five, six, and seven have been complied with. Second. Motion made and seconded that the uh, four said items are complied with on discussion. Hearing none on the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Commissioner so, Lavelle, can you try to call me tomorrow? Jim, can you call me tomorrow? <laughs> yes, certainly, Councilor. Well, I, yes. I, I want to say my, my thanks to, to Kate Sullivan Craven, to Jim Lavelle, Steve Roy, Brian Roy, uh, what what a crew! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, what's that, Jeff? Yeah. Well, 
we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna see. So I mean, for the record, I want it to be known that it's quarter of eight, and this was the extent of my agenda. I want that known. Well, you added something up. Well, you have to. Well, but I want it known for the record. It's, okay. qu it's quarter of eight. Not too bad. Uh, okay, so I'll take a motion to take uh, eight off the table. Uh, how about seven? Seven, eight, yeah. Okay, motion to take item number eight off the table for yeah. discussion. Yeah, yeah, seven's all set. Yeah. Uh, motion to a second to remove agenda item eight from the table. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, proposals for the American Rescue Plan Act, affectionately known as ARPA. So... That's not ARP, that's ARPA. ARPA. That's not ARP, as Councillor Graney rightly pointed out, it is ARPA. And I don't have a good way to do this other than, other than to say I think it probably behooves us to, um, to hear first from Councillor Acting Mayor Murphy. Then I think it behooves us to hear from the Community Development Department. Um, so Alicia Zeller and Kate Preisler is, are here. Uh, to give us a, a, a little synopsis or an overview. And then, and then I, I did want to point out that we've got lots and lots of proposals. And then I had an email that came in that had lots of public comment on it. Uh, let me just see what time my email arrived. I, I can assure you I didn't read it, but I, I would have. But um, that email with public comments came in at 5.11 p.m. And it's an email with an attachment of 105 pages. So to the public, I thank you mm -hmm. for this. And I'm sure they're all, I'm positive they're all valid comments. I have no, no question in my mind. So that leads me to say uh, to the committee, I mean, we can do it. I mean, listen, I'm just one vote. One vote. Um, but to think we're going to comb through all this today, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking it might be wishful thinking. Um, that's why I, I, we need to get some direction from uh, Acting Mayor Murphy and from Alicia. I, I, I want to get, get direction in particular as to when the Acting Mayor would like to see a final vote on this. I, I would recommend the first Tuesday in September as a final vote. Now, I don't have a DGR meeting scheduled between now and then, but that's not to say we can't schedule it, uh, it's, so long as the committee's available um, to, to do that. So, so those are, I just want to make those preliminary comments and turn it to Acting Mayor Murphy. Terry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't expect the committee's going to be able to make a, a final recommendation tonight. We were intending to have a CAC meeting last week, but we had, uh, some illnesses and we were unable to do it. Uh, the CAC is meeting this Thursday uh, with the Community Development uh, Department to go over uh, the proposals to start making recommendations. I'm meeting with City Department heads, uh, Alicia, I believe it's Wednesday morning. Uh, uh, so I'm meeting with all City Departments uh, about the proposals and what they feel are complimentary, what they feel are uh, exclusive and in, 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 in dire need. Uh, the, my, as this whole thing has progressed, my, my hope has always been to try to uh, get as many uh, programs, projects going in early September uh, with the, based on the idea that some of them are shovel ready, if you will, some of the others are program ready uh, and would be able to be implemented quickly uh, once with once the process and obviously uh, Alicia and her staff are going to have to be going through all the proposals once we agree to do things uh, and then work from there so uh, you know I, I can appreciate the the council's concerns about timing uh, and I will certainly try to work with that but I really would like if at all possible uh, as we move along and get a pretty good understanding of this is what most people kind of agree on, uh, that we might be able to move them maybe before the, maybe before the meeting in September. But uh, I, I obviously appreciate the council's recommendation. I would also make one other point, and I didn't realize this, but I've been told by some people that are involved in other communities that we are actually uh, one of the more open process 
in terms of public comment, in terms of having a citizen advisory council review, in terms of having the council review, uh, that a lot of other cities have been told that the mayor's just going ahead and doing it. So uh, I, I, I did see particularly it has named a committee to review it uh, today, but uh, I was just given that information last week. But I, I want this to be an open process. I want it to, ha I want public, and I have received 80 to 90 uh, documents of public comment on a variety of the proposals. Uh, I've heard, had comments in terms of what our priorities should be. Uh, I've, I've had comments in terms of don't rush it. If we did it next year, that's okay. Uh, I personally think we've got things that we need to be doing and, and I, I really would like to get them into the, uh, into action uh, as much as possible. It may not be the entire 13 plus million that we decide right away. Maybe we check this out because the other factor that comes into play is what Congress is going to do with the Infrastructure Act, because it is my understanding that if that comes through, that you know sewer and water potentially could uh, get some funding there. So there's there's other factors, but I th I think you know we want to move uh, with what we know and and what we feel comfortable that we're going to do. Uh, and it, and at least you correct me if I'm wrong, but if we were to do say a sewer project and then find out the infrastructure money came, we could reprogram that uh, that money that we did for the sewer project and take it out of the infrastructure and then reprogram those funds to another project, which is what we could. Think, right? Thank yes. you, Alicia. Yep, absolutely. And let me just make one last comment because uh, Alicia and her staff, uh, and, and we've hired Kate, and I know Kate's gonna do a great job. Uh, you know, they, they, they've worked hard on this, putting this together. Uh, I, I think we've got a lot of very good proposals with a lot of very good uh, potential positive impact on the community. Uh, and again, I just want to move us so that we get those positive impacts as quickly as we can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Terry, for, um, again, for your diligence and, and hard work on, on this topic as well as most other, uh, all other topics, not most, all other topics. Uh, I, so let's go to um, Alicia Zeller. And Alicia, why don't you give us your perspective on this and why don't you just follow up with what Acting Mayor Murphy said relative to the OCD's rec and, and CAC's um, role in this as well, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, the CAC would have met last week, except that we did have staff uh, members that were out of commission. That's one of the reasons that we're meeting with you um, tonight via Zoom from our offices. We don't want to spread anything around. Um, in terms of the proposals, we are ready, uh, the staff and OCD are ready tonight to present what we think should be initially funded for proposals. We went through them and we're focused um, under Mayor Murphy's direction, we're focused on getting some money into the streets. Um, we think it's critical that we get, for instance, rent and mortgage assistance out there as quickly as possible with the CDC's moratorium um, on evictions slated to end very soon. You know, families don't have 30, 60, 90 days to wait for additional rental assistance. There are other items where we know the projects are eligible and we have waiting lists, for example, um, homeowner rehab, we have a, a waiting list for folks to get new roofs, new boilers, that sort of thing. Post COVID, we're seeing more and more families with respiratory issues in their housing. So we're making recommendations around funding housing modifications, um, that sort of thing. And certainly our small businesses and our housing, tourism and hospitality uh, sectors are desperately in need of additional funding. You may have seen there was an announcement um, today about the Small Business Administration providing funding to, um, to support small business. But what we're seeing is some of our small businesses are so small um, and either new uh, fledgling businesses haven't been uh, involved with traditional lenders. And so that's who our grant program is geared towards is those businesses, um, particularly in the downtown sector who may not have access to traditional capital, who may find going to the feds um, to be a daunting experience or maybe language barriers, there may be financial barriers, that sort of thing. Um, so one of the recommendations that we have is to fund the small business and hospitality travel and tourism program as quickly as possible so that we can get those funds out on the streets. 
One of the programs um, or the proposals that received significant public support was the Connecticut River Conservancy and Holyoke Rose, um, the boat ramp improvements project. And so we are recommending that that get funded as soon as possible so that the work there can begin. Um, and then perhaps in future years that the actual programming be supported with either ARPA funds or regular community development block grant money. We tried in this initial round to tick off some of the projects where we knew um, we would be addressing COVID right off the bat. So for instance, staff is recommending that we fire, uh, that we fund the turnout gear for firefighters. Um, we recognize that COVID is continuing um, in the community, the numbers are growing, we don't know where it's going. And so some of these items, we really are ticking off needs um, that really are meeting the immediate COVID concerns. Um, some of these other items, these bigger ticket items, we recognize that in this quick turnaround, they're gonna need some more deliberation. Um, we have a proposal here for wraparound services of a shelter, a warming shelter cafeteria from Providence Ministries. We'd like uh, staff and OCD along with the mayor, we'd like to explore some other funding avenues for projects like that. But I think it's really critical that we get some of this money out the door. So if Kate could share, um, I think Kate is, and I, I should add, we're thrilled to have Kate join us as the new OCD special programs manager. We recognize that within the community over COVID, there were a lot of struggles around capacity um, and getting money out the door and connecting with folks that needed it the most. And so it made sense to bring on someone um, that had federal grant management experience, as well as was already connected to the community. So Kate's gonna be helping us with the, the CDBG COVID money. We have additional money coming from HUD. She's gonna be working in some of these ARPA programs. Although ARPA is not coming to us from HUD, it's coming from the Treasury, it comes with many, many of the compliance items. So Kate's going to be working through those. And it really builds the capacity of our office to work um, with community members um, as opposed to being just focused on the financials. So Kate, if you could share the screen and we could sort of walk through it. Um, one, of the, one of my final points here is that we're not recommending at this point allocating all 14 million of the first tranche I think we need some more time to explore with other departments to make sure that we're not funding projects where funding is eligible elsewhere. For instance, we're trying to get a handle on how much the CARES Act funding is available here in the city. That was the funding that had come in initially. Um, some of these projects may be CARES Act fundable, and so we're trying to figure out you know, what, what's left in CARES Act. There are other projects here where we're hoping that some other partnerships, some other federal funding from HUD um, may fill in the gaps. Okay, Alicia, so what you'll see, uh, uh, Alicia, okay. just, just, uh, sorry, I'm, that was I'm, rapid I'm, fire. No, no, I, I, I like rapid fire, uh, but I'm just gonna, just, just gonna give you a, a minute to just a pause and I wanna recognize Councilor Graney. Yeah, Alicia, sorry for interrupting. I just wanna know if this, oh, no. list, this list that we got here, is this prioritized? I think it would be helpful if the council had a list of priorities, what is prioritized so that we could go in that particular order rather than randomly uh, go back and forth on the list. So is this prioritized? Are these your top priorities or the mayor's top priorities? So, so what we've, uh, what you see is funded um, in the OCD column. So you'll see that first 430, 200, 300. These are our funding priorities. They're addressing what we're hearing, seeing, as needs, what we heard at the public hearing, what we saw in public comments, um, keeping in mind the public health elements as well as the eligibility criteria for um, the ARPA funds. So I would consider the numbers where you see OCD as our priorities right now. But the list, is, if I can, Mr. Just Councilor Murphy. The list is based on like the first page is housing, and, and so that's not necessarily the priorities. Correct. But did she try to get it so, so that they're all balanced the by projects, the kind of things? The projects doing. are not listed in priority; they're grouped by eligibility criteria, so that you're that you, the reviewers, have an opportunity to weigh apples to apples within um, within the subgroups. Yeah. But when we think about priorities. Um, the ones that we funded are what the office would consider priorities. We also did some outreach to some of the agencies. For instance, we know from the waterworks that our suggested project for funding the waterworks is their priority. Cool. We suggested funding their priority number one. Um, we know from DPW um, that they have concerns about the CSO, so we've recommended funding there. Um, and I know that for um, Chief Preskopowski, the turnout gear was a, a 
a criteria, uh, one of the hot items that he had on his initial list. So I feel like the, our recommendations are hitting priorities. Again, OCD priorities may be different than um, DGR priorities, um, that sort of thing. But I think that's why we approached it the way we did is have the community, have the folks that are doing the work tell us what they think the needs are. And clearly there's there's a ton of needs and every one of these proposals is really great. Um, but I'm laser focused. Uh, Kate and I had this conversation this afternoon. We're laser focused on meeting COVID in the community where it is right now. And we feel like these items uh, do that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Graney. Just quickly, I, I, under, I understand that. Uh, but the object is to get priority money out there as soon as possible. So I think it would be helpful if we went outside the box and we had a list of those items which the acting mayor thinks are critical uh, for this ARPA money. That's all I'm saying. And it would make it easier for us to, to look at it and, and make our determinations as we go along. Well, so we typically, we typically have a column on the spreadsheet where the mayor makes his first recommendations. We certainly could work with the mayor and get some preliminary numbers from where he's at and then provide that to you. That would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, okay. Alicia, I, I think that's, that's what I tried to say in my preamble, but you, you, you just summarize it in about a paragraph. So uh, in which, which is the point is that we, we've got you know, 100 pages of applications, another 105 pages of comments. We've got eight pages of, of a spreadsheet, and, and we all know this game. So we, we but although, I, you know, as I said when we did the CDBG, we, we had a really great dialogue back and forth. With it. Having Terry here was invaluable. And, and, and he listened to us, and, and uh, you know, I think he followed up on 98% uh, of it, Terry. Uh, maybe I'm off by something, but I don't think I am by much. So, so, um, so I, I, you know, to me, uh, to follow up with Howie just said, it would be, it's always nice to hear what OCD says and CAC and then and the first cut from the acting mayor. So those three columns, just so the public is, is aware, on our eight-page spreadsheet, those columns are, are, um, are empty. They, they haven't been prepared. So we're, we're kind of taking the first, first shot at it, and that's traditionally not what we do. Um, but before we, I get too far, because I don't want to get, and I, I'm, I'll recognize you in a second, Joe. I, I just want to, and, and I will recognize Joe before I, we do anything else, but um, we did have, we do have one person here from the public, and, and I would be remiss if we didn't at least let that one person came down here so before we get too far afield um, to, to speak. And I don't know if there's anybody online that would want to speak. I, I'm not, this is not a public hearing. So I, I, the first thing I want to do, I want to recognize Council McGivern first, and then I want to entertain a motion to suspend to allow the public to address us within the rules that I'll give in a minute. Oh, is, that, is that okay? So Alicia, just hold your thought, please. And Kate, hold your thoughts. And uh, I want to recognize Councilor McGivern. Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, thank you to, uh, to our mayor uh, for keeping this as an open process. I think that's important and uh, more than willing to uh, participate in it, to the committee for taking it up so quickly. And Alicia, to you, Kate, and staff, and the CAC for all the hard work you've done on this. Um, it's, it's incredible what you've done in such a short period of time. And, Really appreciate that. I, I understand what you're doing. I agree with the uh, OCD recommendations being put out there, and uh, certainly what can be uh, um, fast forward, I, I guess, is something that we I'd be interested in hearing. My only request, and I'm not looking for a response right now. I think you kind of said it, but is that we, out of this 14 million, keep some contingency percentage. Um, I, I've, throughout the COVID uh, process over the last year, everything the federal government has done, whether it's through the state government or not, has changed as quick as you could blink an eye. The formula, the amounts, the deadlines all changed. The loans that went out to small business, the deadlines changed. The amount and how they could spend the money changed as, as they were doing it. And, and mostly for, for the good and, and for the better, of the whole, but it did cause problems, I think, to small businesses when they found three weeks before the deadline, the deadline got expended by six months. So I, I'm just saying that there's a historical possibility 
that the federal formula and deadlines are going to change even on this. But if we could just keep that in mind and keep some contingency funds available, I still believe uh, lost revenue sharing can grow, and I think the way we spend money should grow in terms of uh, municipal operations. And uh, I think that's being said throughout the country, and eventually we just might hear the federal government change things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Alicia, do you, you want to just briefly address Council McGivern's points before we move on to the next phase? I, I would absolutely agree with Council McGivern. Um, it seems that every week the Treasury Department drops additional guidance. Um, we're still operating under a federal interim rule, so we're waiting for it to be finalized. And I think that with we're in a public health crisis, and the clearly the situation is changing. Um, and so I think a holdback makes a lot of sense at this point. Um, but on the flip side, I, I think that we do need to get some money into the community, but I think a holdback makes sense. The money, um, the money is, um, it has a five-year timeline for expenditures. So we have a, a time period for obligation and then it has to be expended in five years. And so I think that we all are in agreement that we want this to be a thoughtful, deliberative um, process that meets the public health needs of the community. All right, Joe, you all set? Thank you. All right. All right, so uh, just from the committee, why don't we just get a motion to suspend to allow the public to address us? Well, motion to suspend the rules to the public to speak. Uh, on the motion, on uh, discussion, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So, um, we're, Steve, is, is that, see if that microphone's on. We haven't done this in forever, so. The button. Is that Hello, okay. hello? Yep. Okay, so um, Steve, under suspension of the rules, I, I know that, uh, so this is Steve Huntley, Executive Director of VOC, and, and Steve, no, no normally, I, I think you're the only one from the public that's, I don't think there's anybody, is anybody on Zoom, Jeff? Uh, there, are, there are two people, uh, they have not raised their hand, but. Um, okay, all right, so that, that maybe they'll want to speak, but just, just to keep it in context, we have 105 pages of public co comment. So Steve, you know, I, you know, you, you, I'll give you the floor, but you know, try to. I will be very brief. Okay. So very, very brief. So my, my three pages of notes won't happen tonight. Okay. So um, just introduce yourself and then uh, take it away. So thank you all for for hearing me tonight. Um, just quickly, I I want to thank you all for this process. This process is open and transparent and really a healthy process for the city. This is money that the the kind of money the city doesn't see year after year or ever, really. This feels like generational money, quite honestly. Um, so with that, we don't want to rush into anything. We don't want to do anything quickly. We don't want to do anything, frankly, that will lead to a cliff where in three years we're, we're you know, saying, oh no, what are we going to do with this? We, we, we have to replace this money somehow. Then where do you look for that? So you know, with those things in mind, um, I will say quickly that, let's see, what can I jump to? Um, water sewer is a good investment for the city. Um, certainly, I wouldn't want to see all of it go to water and sewer, but I, I can't sit here and say, you know, as, as a property owner in the city, we don't, we, we, the increase in water and sewer is far higher than our rents have increased over the years. So the business aspect of the water and sewer and an investment there to try and help hold those rates would be really, really welcome. Um, the broadband, we were a partner on the broadband application. Uh, we heard nice update from them, so I won't beat that horse, but certainly um, broadband to the poor wards is very important to me, and, and this would be an ideal way to get that in. Uh, you know, I think the business plan to bringing broadband or fiber to the lower wards probably is, I mean, in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, their estimate was in 10 years it would break even. And I don't think that's the lower wards that they're that they anticipate getting the 40% connectivity where they would in fact break even. So using this to connect that is really really essential. Um, and as we think about, well, maybe the pandemic's over. Hopefully, I, I don't know that we any of us agree with that. But the reality is, I think snow days are a thing of the past. So kids, if they don't have a quality, reliable broadband, are going to fall behind. Um, and lastly, I'll talk about the two VOC specific ones. One was the, um, the homeless prevention or rental support. Um, we've used uh, CSBG, um, I'm sorry, CDBG CARES money for that program. 
We're scheduled to run out over the coming months. It always depends on, on how many people walk through the door. We have around 50,000 left that we haven't spent of the close to 300,000 that we were awarded. So um, as, the, as the moratorium ends July 31st, I'm not sure if they're gonna extend that or not. There's not a whole lot of guidance about if that's gonna change. We're worried about that. And then the other one we asked for us, uh, I'll say small, it's not 15 million, um, 30,000 a year. And that is to uh, uh, enhance a small program we do um, that's an offshoot of what was used to be known as welfare to work, where we take folks that are on DTA and train them to get to living wages. Where we've had the most success is getting folks to get a CDL, and we're seeing outcomes where folks are making $27, $28 an hour after finishing that program from minimum wage. It's unbelievable, and there's this cluster of folks that don't quite fit in. Maybe they're working two jobs, so they don't, uh, they don't fit the income money, and it's just a tiny investment, in my mind, for really amazing outcomes. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry to take up so much of it in this public oh. input, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, do somebody, somebody with a hand up? Yep. Yeah, Sarah Meir Zimbler. Uh, who's got the hand up? If you, could just, if you could just recognize her, Jeff. Yeah, this is uh, Sarah Meir Zimbler. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry. I'm, I'm Sarah Meyer Zimbler. I'm with the Holyoke Housing Authority, um, and we submitted an application. Um, obviously, want to thank the council members and community development, Mayor Murphy, everyone who's here. Um, just wanted to talk very briefly about an application that the Housing Authority has put in to build home ownership in South Holyoke. Um, I think uh, Steve Huntley very well said that this is sort of a once in a generation program. I think building generational wealth in communities like South Holyoke um, is an important endeavor. And so I just ask the committees, uh, ha you know, happy to answer any questions, but just wanted to put in um, a plug to to build low income homeownership uh, in South Holyoke. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Jeff, is there anybody else? Nobody's raised their hand. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right, um, Alicia. I get Alicia back. Alicia, there she is. I'm here. Is that Joe? There she is. Oh. Okay. Hi, Alicia. All right. So I, I told you to hold that thought. Um, so, all right. Before we get there, uh, what is it? What, what is it? Because I've been doing all the guidelines here. What does the committee want to do on this? Because we, I think, we need some direction. Pete. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Alicia, for coming down. I, I had an opportunity to talk to Alicia today, and um, as you stated, uh, Mr. Chairman, okay. about how we're going to do this. You know, usually we get we have a program where we start with their recommendations, <coughs> then CAC, then then uh, then us, then to the full council, then to finally to the mayor. So, I would like to see. I know she said she had numbers from the OCD tonight. I would love to see that go through those, and if we decide possibly to give our recommendations. Um, we still can get them from, um, you know, the CAC. They're meeting Thursday. Uh, I agree with um, Mayor Murphy that uh, the sooner we can get this out, um, I think it would be beneficial. If we have to take time, we can decide that as a committee to take time to do it. But they do have recommendations for us tonight. I think I just wrote a few of them down on the first page. I think we should go through all of what they think is important, prioritize, and then go from there. Okay. Does anybody, can a member want to? Say something on that, Council Sullivan. I would just like to ask a question of Alicia, as, as far as how we're going through this. Okay, hold 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 that thought. I just I just want to deal with logistics right this second. Yeah, uh, Councilor Graney. Yeah, I just like to see what the priorities are from the mayor, you know, and take it piecemeal, you know, not rush into this thing, but get the priorities out there, get it before the council, and see if we can move on some of these things and right. and do it so that it's in a timely fashion so that uh, everybody out there understands what we're doing and how we're doing it and you know under the mayor's priorities and uh you know but to, like you say we have it took me three hours this afternoon to read through all this material and uh you know like i say uh, we're gonna have the same situation when we go to the full council if we go one one piece by piece by piece by piece we're uh, 
it's, it's not going to be effective because the viewers out there who are watching this on television are, are going to lose interest after two or three hours. So I think uh, we need to make our priorities uh, uh, straight, uh, succinct to the, uh, the public so that they see what we're doing and, uh, and we have evidence to back up uh, uh, what, what the mayor needs and what the mayor wants. That's all. Well, sir Graney, I can't imagine any viewers losing interest when I'm chairing a meeting, but uh, okay. So, uh, so let, let, me, uh, let me just throw out my two cents and then we'll turn over to Alicia. I, I, I think we should probably um, realize that we're probably gonna have to have a, a, a second meeting on this. I, I, I've got certain dates open on my calendar. Uh, for example, August 9th, August 23rd, that I, that I could make myself available. So I, 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 we, we should, should probably consider that having just one of our regular meetings like we do for CDBG. But that's my, that's my thought. Councilor Sullivan. All right, so. Go ahead, Mike, yeah. All right, so uh, Ali, uh, through the chair, uh, Alicia, uh, I'd like to just ask on one example here. You out there? She's there, just ask. She's there, just ask. Fire away, Mike. Speak. Right. Um, one, one example of... So, like the, the, the very first one where we're looking for four uh, OCDs recommending $430,000, but the total ARPA request is for 2150000 Now, if, if we were to grant that four thirty, are we on the hook for another $1.7 going forward? No. Right, and... That, that's a great that's a great question counselor and the answer um, as far as we're concerned is no so this first round will have contracts with each one of these agencies and the contracts will only be for the amount that's been allocated through this process you could um, and you'll see on some of them where we've opted to fund the entire ARPA request up front but um, we also recognize that some of these uh, some of these proposals can be parceled out. So for instance, for 2.15 million, you would get 11 uh, single family owner occupied houses. And we're saying, you know, instead of starting with 11, let's start with um, probably two of them. 430 will probably get us two. Um, and so just because you funded it initially doesn't mean that you are on the hook to fund the entire request. I would caution that we continue to work through these um, to determine if we did an initial, you know, seed money, where does that leave the project? Um, very similar to CDBG, where if you only fund it for half of what the request is, where does, where does that leave you? So for instance, the boat ramp improvements, if you only funded it at half of the $128,000 request, you're not, they're not gonna be able to do the project. That needs to be fully funded. Um, if you opted to fund the fire department turnout gear at less than $338,519, that means the fire department just gets fewer sets of turnout gear. Um, so some of them are adjustable, some of them are not, but the contracts that we're going to produce in this first round are strictly for the amounts that are going to be provided um, at the final allocation. We're not going to, we're not going to commit additional money beyond what's been allocated. Similarly, we're going to watch to make sure that we're keeping a master total of the first 14 million, but we're also keeping an overall total of the whole program because we don't want to um, overcommit or uh, create a situation where someone's expecting funding in the second round and, it, and it's just not going to happen. Right. Okay. I think I think you've explained that very well. Thank you. Okay. So Alicia, why don't you take the next uh, few minutes to to go through what what, what Councilor Thomas suggested? Go through the OCD sure. recommendations. And then at least we'll have that on our record and we can take okay. it from there, okay? Happy, happy to do that. All right. I wanna preface it by saying that just because OCD isn't recommending a project right now doesn't mean that we wouldn't recommend it. Um, should we get more money or should we get more an infrastructure money um, or that we're not looking at proposals here to see what other federal funding that we may be getting outside of ARPA um, that is usable. So. Every one of these proposals is a really, it's a really critical proposal. People took a lot of time to get them in. Um, so I just want to say that up front. I always feel like I'm being asked to pick the favorite child. 
And, and certainly that's not, um, that's not what we're trying to do. We're really trying to address what we see as community needs, as well as the capacity of the organizations, other contracts that we have with organizations right now, that sort of thing. So saying that, um, so we're recommending 430 for Habitat for Humanity. That will probably be two single family um, owner occupied housing units uh, for low and moderate income families. And we're hoping that they're gonna actually partner with the city and choose two city owned vacant lots, um, which is sort of hitting two, two priorities for the city. One is to, to get vacant lots off our books, but also to create home ownership and to have a tax paying entity. Um, the rental neighborhood improvement program for 200,000 will provide funding for rental property owners to make improvements. Um, those kind of uh, improvements can be gas to electric conversion, energy efficiencies, the sort of programs that you discussed with hg &E earlier tonight. We're recommending 300,000 for the neighborhood improvement program, which provides up to $10,000 for our owner occupied housing improvements. Um, this is a program that's critical to our older population in the city. It allows them to age um, in their homes uh, for nominal dollars. It keeps our housing stock up with a good level of repair. We're recommending 100,000 through v Revitalize CDC. You all um, have met with them in the past um, around air quality in rental units. And so this proposal is to do $100,000 worth of improvements for COVID impacted residents um, around air quality in their homes. So it might be removing carpeting, installing um, air filtration, that sort of thing. And then if we're skipping down, thank you by the way for Kate for directing this tonight. Um, so we're recommending that we get going on the boat ramp improvements, overwhelming uh, community support from all levels of the community, all kinds of folks um, on getting that boat ramp up and operational. There's a public safety component to it. Um, there is an, a disabled rower, disabled river user um, part of the whole part of the whole program. And as I like to point out, in the city of Holyoke, a city that was built um, on its water power, we have 12 miles of Connecticut River uh, frontage here in the city, and we only have one public access point, and that's Jones Ferry. So we really need to make uh, those improvements. And we've also seen a huge increase um, in pandemic around public facilities and folks getting outside and getting on the river is, is key. We're recommending the 338 for turnout gear for the firefighters. Um, we feel like that's a public health uh, prevention. They'll, be, they'll each have two sets. And so um, they can be sanitized, that sort of thing between responses. It also uh, eliminates any concerns for carcinogenics or reduces the carcinogenic risk um, between fires. Um, so uh, these couple, um, at this time, we're recommending 25,000 for a refrigerated box truck um, for a mobile food bank for Providence Ministries. Typically, the food bank distributions um, that happen here in the city don't have perishables because the boxes, there's no way to keep everything fresh and safe as it's transported around the city. And so this proposal uh, would, able, would enable that. We're also suggesting $7,000 for Nueva Esperanza for food distribution. We've not worked with Nueva Esperanza in the past few years. Um, they're really trying hard to get themselves reestablished on Main Street um, in, in that neighborhood, in the flats. And so we feel like if this is an opportunity to give them a small grant to get them um, rolling again. I point those two out because if indeed the city has CARES Act funding available, it may be that we withdraw the recommendation um, for those two and we use some remainder of the CARES Act. Um, but that balance, um, we're still waiting to hear how much is available. Um, the rent and mortgage assistance is straightforward. Um, we're recommending funding for, um, for the first year and then kind of see how pandemic goes, what's gonna happen with the eviction moratorium. But we know that if we don't get folks uh, housed stably, then um, we are gonna end up with a bigger crisis around homeless families in the city and we, and we won't have um, a place to put them. Or um, it also creates a situation where they go to get another unit and they have an eviction on their record and it just makes it so much more challenging. We're recommending that we partner with VOC on that because VOC does have an existing rental assistance program through the CDBG CV program that Steve mentioned and it's been working really well. They've been able to uh, meet Alicia. all of the high thresholds for compliance. Um, and the review of their files has been positive so far. Alicia? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, Alicia, just just uh, half a pause. Uh, just hold on a second. Um, I'm I'm trying to follow you here, Alicia, as you're going, and these the list of these items that you're doing. They're not numbered. I'm trying to scroll down because I really okay. can't see that. I can't see that thing in front of me. So I'm I'm trying to work off my own sheet and listen to. Is there a way to? Is it on the screen in front of you? Yeah, yeah. but I can't yes, I yeah. can't really see it. Yeah. Okay. So I can oh, I can oh, why don't we stop you know, and Alicia, um, we're on page Yeah, that's that's it. So Alicia, why, why don't we do it this way? Cuz cuz they they are numbered at the top. So e yep. each each section has a number. So just say you know, so right now we're in section 2.2. Okay. 2. And so why don't you just tell okay, so 2.2 you you already hit that one. Yep. Why, Tell us what so two point two. We're, we're recommending one hundred ninety five thousand six hundred seven to so, Valley Opportunity yeah, Council. Yeah, yeah, we copied. So, what, what's the next okay. section we're going to hit? And the next section is economic development two point nine okay. and two point eleven. All right. All right. Pro proceed. Uh, proceed accordingly. Thank you. And the only application in that category is from this office, and that is to get our small business and hospitality, travel, tourism industry grants program up and operational, and that's one point five million. The next category is age is nonprofits 2.10. Okay. We're recommending 80,000 to Habitat to staff their operations in Holyoke while they get their new houses built. And we're recommending 100,000 to Spark um, because we feel like Spark's small business development program is a pipeline to ensure that, that the small businesses that are new fledgling um, have some level of stability in accessing our local federal grants. Moving to um, services to disproportionately impacted populations, education assistance, social, emotional, and mental health services, 3.4. Um, I want to stop here for a moment and just say that one of the um, priorities within ARPA is addressing mental health and behavioral health um, in the community. And the OCD staff felt like this was an area where we wanted to ensure that children, particularly children and young people in our community have access to quality mental health services and behavioral health services. Um, I don't think that we've seen the full impact um, on behavioral health and mental health. Um, and a lot of this I think will come to the surface once kids go back to school and they're reconnected with providers, um, either through the Y or Girls Inc. And so we felt like this was um, a real community need. Um, for many of the kids, there's just no, the waiting list to get in um, to, to see a provider right now is very long. And so we felt like funding these behavioral health services would enable most kids in the city to tap into some sort of services. We're covering River Valley in the public schools, we're covering Girls Inc. for young women, we're covering the Y, um, and we're also targeting um, behavioral health invention, in, interventions for young people. Um, we think the, particularly the ROCA application would assist with community violence. We know across the country we've seen an uptick. Um, it, it typically involves younger folks. And so we feel like these behavioral health um, proposals are critical. Um, moving down, the next recommended um, category is um, clean water combined sewer overflow. We're recommending $1 million for the Jackson Street area sewer separation. I want to point out that the original um, spreadsheet that you got might have indicated a nine and $10 million in that in those blocks, but the DPW, we clarified it with them. It was our error and they're actually only requesting $1 million from ARPA this year and $1 million total. So we are recommending to move forward with the combined sewer overflow um, with Jackson Street. We think the CSO projects make a lot of sense if we're gonna be putting more people um, on the river. We're also holding back some of the recommendations um, for infrastructure to kind of see what's gonna happen um, with Congress and if there's gonna be additional funding coming down the line. The next area that we're making recommendations is with drinking water transmission and distribution, 5.11. And we're recommending funding the waterworks number one priority. Um, they indicated that this was a critical water line replacement. 
And although they indicated that it's only serving 193 households within the qualified census tract, that's the geographic area where the Treasury Department's asking us to focus our funds. Um, we also learned that that line is going to serve the Holyoke Medical Center um, in their building expansions. And so we think that is a critical water line um, resource that should get funded. Um, moving down, I want to touch on broadband. We held any recommendations. We heard loud and clear about broadband, but we held any recommendations because a um, couple reasons. One is we wanted to have some more discussions with Gas and Electric about other funding that might be coming. We wanted to get better clarification on how many lower or moderate income households would be served by the project. And we needed some more clarification on whether or not um, what would happen if just the design was done? One of the concerns is we don't want to use these federal dollars. They're COVID-related public health response dollars, and we want to make sure that they're being used not just for design. So um, the recommendation there is not a reflection of the broadband. We, we recognize that broadband is a priority with the Treasury, but we want to work with gas and electric a little bit more. And, and I think after hearing from them tonight, um, that, that sort of supported our feeling here in the office. Um, the city auditor's office, we're skipping down to 6.1. The city auditor's office has done a calculation of municipal loss revenue replacement of 1.7 million. Um, so we're asking obviously that that, that gap be filled um, and be filled for the city as quickly as possible. I did note here that um, future requests are to be determined. We're waiting for additional guidance. Um, as Tanya continues to do annual calculations, there may be more lost revenue. There may be a subsequent request. We'll have to see. But for right now, we're recommending the 1.7. Um, all of this work and all of this um, administration does cost money, um, staff time for all of this. And so our estimate for the annual cost to administer the funding is um, $213,200, which is one of the lowest admin rates um, that you could possibly get. We are asking that we set aside the full administrative administration and planning expenses for the program to ensure that we have the staff to do the compliance reporting, um, bookkeeping, financial, all of the contracts over the term of the grant for five years. So that's why we're asking that the 1.3 be set aside right up front. Um, we did think about the city clerk's office, um, and that's not shown as a recommendation, but I think that because we've um, funded less than 4.9 million, that it would make sense to probably drop the 45,000 in and get the city clerk the assistance they need, particularly in light of the fact that we may be facing um, sort of a return to, not sort of, but a, a possible return to remote work, remote access of records, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, at this point. And then finally, we had an application that didn't fit into any of the categories. Um, and so we're going to work with Gary Rome Hyundai offline to see if perhaps we can get him fit into the small business grant program once um, that gets up and operational. So that's, that's sort of where we're at. And Alicia, what, what, did, what is yours? What, what are the total? Because that, that's my favorite part. So okay, that's Kate, Kate that's next door. Okay. Oh, there it is. So, That's Kate, does that include part. the forty-five thousand? So four. So fourteen. One three three. One three three. Just double check. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, looks like fourteen thousand one hundred and thirty-three dollars and. Uh, $14,133,302. Okay, and just if I made it to uh, act, is Terry still here? Thank you. Terry, I can't stand talking with my back down. I apologize, but this is a, this is a, this is a brave new world we're in. Yeah. Um, so I do apologize. Uh, but uh, Terry, uh, it's my understanding that, that, that the city did receive some funds from the Treasury. So, yes. so d does that... Does that match the 14.1, or, or, or where, where are we with? Uh, I believe we got 14.9. Oh, okay, so we got 14.9 in the bank. Okay, so it looks like OCD kind of heard what, before even Councilor McGivern said it, uh, kind of what Councilor McGivern So is that what, you, what you're doing here, Alicia? You're kind of holding back 800,000 or something? Is that, is that what I'm seeing? 
That's correct. We we made a strategic decision to hold back um, eight hundred thousand to kind of see where where COVID's going. Um, we had some other projects um, that are shown on this proposal that I'm looking at other federal funding from HUD where we may where they may have requested um, a, you know X number of dollars and we may be able to do some sort of match with other programs over the next few months. Um, but really, from a public health perspective, we felt like holding back 800,000 right now um, made, made a lot of sense. You know, that would enable the city to respond to um, any kind of emergency situations, that sort of thing. <laughs> One of the nice things with ARPA is that we're not tied at this point with the interim rule is we're not tied to the very strict regulatory world of CDBG where we have to go through, um, you know, we have to get HUD approval and, and submit and we have reporting and that sort of thing, but there's a little more freedom. And so I feel like if that 800,000 was held back and we found that, you know, Sean said, I've got to isolate folks, we got to put them in a hotel, then we could probably tap into this, tap into this funding to do that. And so I think at this point in time with everything that's going on, it makes sense. Okay. so. Uh, so, Council Tallman, so we, we went through the OCD part. Are you satisfied for at this point, or would you would you be willing to? And I, I, we're just we're just talking right well, you're now. Talking, yeah. But w would you be willing to maybe consider? And you know, we need to mull over this for a little while. And I, then, I agree. I'll I, recognize I, Council Lisi in a second. But the only the only thing I'm concerned about a little bit is um, with the funding. If we can get some of this that we know we're going to vote on. To the full council, like the 1.7 million, the which, balance of budget. Which one's that, Pete? The uh, the one, the city auditor's office, the lost revenue. I think that's important to try to get that. Well, do, do we want to get a take from council from acting mayor? Absolutely, Murphy first? absolutely, and I, and I I think it's important that we get some of these things to the council. I mean, we have how many pages? How many people rec recommendations? Five. It's a lot. I think we have to go through those. I think we have and, to go through them. Yeah. And I think we could have another meeting, but. Um, I think the sooner we get some of the important things going, as Mayor Murphy said, um, if it has to wait till September, fine. But um, if we can get something to the council that we know we're all in agreement with, especially that 1.7 million to sort of help balance the budget somewhat, I think all right. I think that's crucial. Council Green, you want to get a take on that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. But it would be nice if we had that spreadsheet with those recommendations on this rather than having to. You know, cutting right. down the thing. If we had that tonight, it would well, make it much better. Right, we, well, we, we don't, but well, okay, we, we don't have it. Tonight, but we have, saying, we have to uh, move on. Uh, Councillor Tom, right, I right. agree with that. Yeah, and I, I think we're waiting too also from CAC recommendations. They may mirror the same ones we got from OCD, or they may be a little bit different. So I, I think to hear from the CAC also, then we can make our recommendations uh, I, at we, another we, meeting. We've right. got to hear from CAC. Mike, definitely, Mike yeah. you want to weigh in? Yeah, definitely. I just had one question. Fire away. Go back. Can fire away. Alicia, back to 5.4. The Jackson Street sewer separation. Sorry, so, my mouse is going crazy tonight. Yep. So the number I've got is 9 million and 10 million. Yeah. But those Correct. Are I, those that's are where I noted um, that was an error on our part, and it should be one million and one million. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those are typos. Yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't. Hear that we gave you we, we gave you total project costs as opposed to how much they were asking for out of ARPA. Kate and I believe Kate confirmed that with um, Bob Parent. Okay. Mike, follow up. All right. Before I recognize Councilor Lisi, uh, Councilor Murphy, did you want to weigh in on what Councilor Tallman suggested? Uh, I certainly don't have a problem with what he's suggesting. I, I do think, and it may, maybe this is another way to look at this, is uh, you know there there are going to be areas where probably everybody's going to be in agreement, and since we are not going to necessarily appropriate all this money at one time, we may be able to have the council review certain parts, offer after you get the CAC recommendations. Let the council make that judgment, then refer that to the mayor's office, and then take that portion of the money that everybody's in agreement, and then continue with another meeting in August to, to finalize as much as we're going to do. Uh, you know, I, I this is, I mean, I've obviously 
spoken with Alicia a few times in the last three and a half months. She's very tired of talking to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we will meet again and go over certain things, and there's things here that I know I like. There's things here I'm going to ask exactly why on this instead of this. Uh, so, you know, but I do think there are the, the 1.7 million, I think, in terms of putting that into the city budget certainly makes sense so that we know that is, in fact, there. Uh, and as you make other decisions in the, in the near future, that certainly makes sense. And then other, there's other things, the rental, the rental assistance, I think. Uh, the, the thing about the asthma, I think, I, I, I mean, I know I had a meeting this morning about uh, the asthma impact on kids going to school, and, you know, it's, it's a tremendous impact. We're working with UMass on trying to do some additional air quality, and uh, Steve was there, One Hoyoke was there, Hoyoke Housing Authority were all there, and they're all agreeing to let us monitor the air quality in their buildings. But there's a lot of things that are uh, essential to kind of get moving. Uh, and and you know I, and if we can do some of those and, and council feel comfortable, that would be uh, that would be something I would appreciate. All right, Council Lisi. Thank you very much, um, Chair Bartley. Uh, Alicia, I have the screen up here. Um, I had some trouble keeping up when you were doing um, on my page five um, services to disproportionately impacted populations. I'm looking at childcare. Um, at the Boys and Girls Club, was that funded or? We did not recommend funding it at this time. Mm -hmm. um, again, that might be a COVID, uh, a CARES Act eligible activity, but we did not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was definitely um, wondering, j just because it seems like if we want to get folks back into the workforce, mm -hmm. um, child care is one of those things that's going to um, facilitate that. Um, and we definitely want to get folks back into to the workforce after the, the past year. Um, so I'll be interested in, in following that via vis-a-vis -vis the other recommendations that come through. Uh, the one other comment that I wanted to make was um, I do agree with your line of reasoning related to the fiber um, funding. I'd rather see the money go to actually create and establish the network as opposed to um, do studies. It seems that if they have the $30 million uh, pro forma estimate at this point in time, um, you know, I would just like them to be in a position where we could, now that we have this money, cut that cost um, and, and start to roll out the, the service. But it seems that we're a little bit further behind in the process than um, where at least I would like to I ideally be. Um, so thanks for explaining your reasoning there. Okay. Um, so, oh, yeah, Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I'm hearing it from almost everybody, but I think in, in fairness to the, um, before the committee and the full city council makes their recommendations, CAC should have a chance to, to weigh in. They do the bulk of the work with the public, listening to the public, and always I like to hear what their recommendations are. As far as the $1.7 million, I, I again hope that grows somewhere down the line, but that's the cap right now that we're being told. And, and I think at any moment, you know, we, we should be able to say and agree to that with, with the mayor and with everybody. Um, the importance of the $1.7 million is as we get closer to setting the tax rate, which is usually October, uh, November. But obviously, I, I think knowing that it's going to be there and that that message is important. December. October. <laughs> Yeah, who, 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 who said October? <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> wow. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's doing in October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, we're not in those communities, so that's the problem. Uh, well, I, I would say, uh, from, for my part, I, I agree with the 1.7 million. Uh, I just don't take a vote on that now. And then, uh, and then I, I think just to, I mean, I, 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 for one, would like at least one of these improvement program things. I'd like to take a vote on one of those, just get something, on, something the, on the street. So if we did something for the city and then something for the one Holyoke CDC, at least we could say, you know, we got something out the door for August 3rd, for heaven's sakes. And then, then, then we, can, we can come back. We don't have to schedule it right this second. We can, we can chew on it a little bit. I think we're, we're, we're going to need to hear, it's a committee who just indulge me, if we're, we're going to need to hear from Councilor, because if we start setting dates for our meeting and Councilor Murphy is not ready 
to present, and the lease was not ready to present to us, then wh why are we setting dates for a meeting? So, so wh why, don't, why don't we tentatively look at the back end of August? I think yeah. August 9th is too aggressive. Yeah, I agree. It's too aggressive. Yeah. So why, why don't we just, as a potential placeholder, Jeff, just put in August 20, are you on vacation, Jeff, that time, that week? Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll put in a, a potentially August 23rd, but, but, but we're not gonna be married to it. Uh, a, a, but in case Councilor Murphy needs a little more wiggle room. So Councilor Murphy, just to you directly, would, would you be, are you okay with the 1.7 and then a couple of dollars for the uh, Holyoke seat, one Holyoke, or is that, is that out of bounds? And I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, I, I'm certainly okay with the 1.7. Is that enough? You want to leave it there? Yep. Okay, then that's, that's all you got to uh, tell me. And the others, I, I'd like to hear. Terry? I said, I'm meeting with the department heads, NSCAC. Yep. Terry, yeah, Terry yeah, that's all you got to say. Let's have them. Yeah, that's all you got to say. So I, 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 okay, is that okay, Joe? The 1.7? You're good with that? Yep. Yeah, you can support that. Yeah, so, but you can support that. I think that's all okay. right. Yeah. Pete, you want to make the motion? Yeah, I make a motion to uh, recommend uh, $1.7 million uh, in the, um, the oh, auditors. Uh, offset the uh, motion being a second to um, to to recommend approval of the of 1.7 million dollars of the uh, ARPA funds, ARPA to, funds the, to the City Council under discussion I think we had a I think we had a decent discussion on that uh, already uh, on uh, on the motion all in favor aye. Aye. aye opposed none okay so we will forward that portion of this vote to the full City Council for, uh, for August 3rd on the um, uh, on the rest of it, uh, Alicia, um, I I, it's, I think the body's going to table this for tonight. The rest of it, uh, but we do uh, appreciate both of you and Kate being here. And um, is, that, is that what I'm hearing from the body? Okay. Yep, so okay. So uh, and we'll 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 reconvene at some point after the CAC has met and you've met with Mayor, Mayor Murphy, and um, we'll do it again. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just take a, uh, a motion to table, please. Motion to table. Second. Motion made a second to table and debatable on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we, we will take a, uh, a motion to adjourn with the caveat that we'll, we'll, we're thinking about August 23rd to take this up again, okay? Motion to adjourn and uh, possible August 23rd meeting. All right, motion made a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.